Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to Circle of Fellows uh, for September, uh, I'm sorry, August 2023. I'm jumping ahead to September. I'm looking forward to it because I'm going on vacation. Uh, but this is for August 2023. I'm Shell Holtz. I am Senior Director of Communications at uh, WebCore. We are a commercial builder uh, headquartered in the Bay Area. I'm in the office in Alameda today. And I am joined by three of my fellow fellows uh, to have a conversation today about creativity in communication. I'm looking forward to this one. It's going to be fun. Uh, and I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. I'll go clockwise. Uh, Cindy, who Great. are you? Hi. Hi, Shell. Thanks for having me on this event. I'm really looking forward to it because throughout my career, I've had a lot of time to work on introducing creative elements into communications. So I spent a lot of time in corporate communications, working for a global manufacturer of components for the semiconductor industry. I've done some time at the agency side, and then I transitioned into academics, and I'm now an adjunct faculty member for Southern New Hampshire's University's online graduate communication program. Great, thank you, and it's great to have you here. Um, glad you're indoors where it's cool in yes. sweltering Phoenix. Uh, Brad, you're up. Thank you, Shell. Good to see you, Cindy and Jennifer. I am coming to you from Windsor, California, um, wine country where the grapes in the backyard are going through Verizon and we're getting close to harvest. Uh, so not quite as sweltering as it might be in Phoenix. Um, my background includes a little bit of broadcast way back when. Um, some time spent, most of it, in internal communications and exec communications at high-tech companies like the HPs and the Cisco's and Hitachi's of the world. Um, lately, been doing consulting work for a number of different clients and also doing exec coaching, both for the Stanford MBA program and most recently for the Cornell University MBA program. So uh, all over the place and uh, enjoying the variety that brings from grapes to grad students. <laughs> uh, how alliterative. Uh, thanks, Brad. And Jennifer. Hi, I'm here from North Vancouver, Canada, where I haven't checked the comparison temperature, but I'm going to guess it may be uh, not that far off Cindy's in Phoenix. Um, we're having a very hot uh, summer, as many are, and I'm looking forward to some cool, uh, cool weather. Um, I have my own storytelling agency here in North Vancouver, and uh, and I've been talking about storytelling for most of my career, even before it was the buzzword it is now. Um, and of course, elements of storytelling <clears throat> uh, oftentimes powerfully include um, creative aspects. So that's been a real passion of mine for a long time. Uh, like my esteemed colleagues, I have also now added academia to my um, to my set of experiences and absolutely love teaching third year business students at um, the University of British Columbia's Sauter School of Business program. So that's uh, that's a pretty happy place and getting excited for the term ahead to start soon. Terrific. And I'm, I'm, I'm reading Mark Dollins's uh, book on employee communications. And uh, last night, as I was uh, reading in bed, I turned the page and I was on the chapter about storytelling. And I said, well, that's timely. Uh, so I'm sure we're going to talk about storytelling as one of the forms of creativity today. Before we jump into that, though, I do want to let everybody who is watching uh, in real time know that you can participate uh, you're watching on YouTube. There is a comment field, and uh, I'm able to uh, see those and share them. So uh, questions that you have for the panelists, observations, your own experiences are all welcome. We love to have the conversation driven in part by uh, those of you who are in the audience watching. Uh, but let's start off with the obvious question. Um, a lot of corporate communications that we see are uh, very, as as your headline put it, Brad, meh. Um, and even uh, when I was uh, moderating a panel at the World Conference in Toronto this year uh, talking about artificial intelligence, uh, one of the observations that was made is that uh, tools like ChatGPT produce writing that is good enough. And a lot of what communicators 
are called on to do just needs to be good enough. So if all we're doing is getting messages out there and they just need to be good enough, why do they need this additional uh, ingredient of, of creativity? Are you going to run to read something that's just good enough? I'm not. That's boring. I agree with that. It's like the engagement piece, the grabbing the attention. If people remember what they see, they don't really remember all the words that they read. So if you, if you have a message and it's important enough to even send out there, you should make it so that people pay attention to it. And I would add that if you are just doing what everybody else has been doing and it's good enough, you're just contributing to the white noise. And right now, everyone faces this information overload, a lot of stuff. And so I think our job regularly is to find ways to break through and maybe for some things, um, lists and God knows what all else, um, earnings reports, you know, the, the, there is a room for mundane. But I think by and large, the value that we add as communications professionals is finding ways to not do what everybody else is doing and um, come up with things that grab people's attention and make them read and, and want to get more. Yeah, when I think about good enough, I tend to think about things like uh, the reminder of the deadline for enrolling in your benefits. Uh, people don't want to miss the deadline. They'll pay attention to that. But... Uh, you know, using a tool like AI to produce that good enough stuff should leave us more time to be creative on the material that really calls for it. Uh, Ed Robertson, uh, the late Ed Robertson, who was the head of internal comms at FedEx, came up with this thing he called the pyramid of communication quality, uh, sort of the communicator's version of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And at the top of it was uh, behavioral change. Uh, which is what we want from people ultimately when we communicate with them. But to get there, you had to go through other layers. And the, the, you know, the first one was logistics, right? If, if you get a notice that your benefits enrollment has to be completed by November 10th and you receive that on November 15th, that's a failure of logistics. But the next one up is attention. Um, and it, it, if you don't grab their attention, they're not going to get to figuring out why I should pay attention to this. So how do you employ creativity uh, in pursuit of attention? Well, let me throw in one thought, too, is that I think we spend our time many times in the wrong place. Um, historically, it's that write the long, long, long article, the, the major piece that is going to uh, be read by everybody and poured over by lawyers and HR people and everybody else. And what we tend to not spend a lot of time doing is focusing on things like the headlines, um, the blurbs that are pulled out, the captions that go underneath photos. In fact, there's probably an inverse relationship with the amount of time that we spend, and those things tend to come at the last possible minute. And I am reminded by Don Ranley, one of our fellow fellows, about this, hey, you know, let's focus a little bit more on the things that people are going to read first, which tend to be they're going to look at the photo, they're going to look at the headline, they're going to look for a call out blurb of some sort and get pulled into an online article, what have you. But part of the problem is we're spending time in the wrong places if we really want to do the right thing, which is get people to read or view what it is that we're doing. You know, and I, I couldn't agree more, Brad. And when we, um, you know, when we're when we do as we are trained to do as communication professionals, which is put our audience first, I, I really do like to sit down and think, um, what is it my audience today, my audience of leaders, my audience of all employees, my audience of um, frontline sales staff, what is it that they might, that might grab their attention? Um, many, many years ago, and it, it, it may seem really obvious, but I may have, it was probably a session with Don Ranley. It was at a conference. Uh, in fact, now that I recall it was, um, and uh, he, he offered up the reminder that we that that it's part of our job to keep abreast of current events, current news, um, to read all all um, a variety of genres and um, and subject areas, so that we have springboards to connect with our audience. A good example would be sports analogies. That's not in my wheelhouse. I am the most reluctant hockey bum uh, you could imagine. Um, but I've learned to, uh, you know, holler out to my to my teenage son and my husband and say, hey, what's a what's a golf analogy I could use here? Because there's a major golf tournament happening. 
And I know this particular audience fits the demographics potentially um, of golf viewers. Uh, so where we can bring um, relatable experience and inject an element of creativity that connects that relatable experience to our audience, I think we're showing up uh, in ways that engage them. I think if you keep your eagle eyes on that sort of stuff, you're going to come up way above par for the course. And about connecting to people like that, you have been doing some research on collaboration lately. And to get people to contribute, it, it requires that they are connected and they are more willing to contribute to a discussion or an activity if they, uh, if they can make a connection with the other people in common interest. So I think that's an important piece if we're talking about employees and getting them to take actions or engage. Yeah, and Jennifer, you talked about uh, the different audiences, and and one of the things uh, Ed Robertson pointed out, and it was it was in uh, Communication World that he had published that pyramid of communication quality, IABC's former uh, magazine, member magazine. But uh, one of the points that he made is that what's going to grab the attention of the, the guys who go down into the mine is not the same thing that's going to grab the attention of the people in the C-suite. Uh, so, I mean, that's a dimension of creativity, isn't it? Uh, I, knowing uh, what kind of creativity to apply to different targeted audiences? Absolutely. Just literally just this morning at my desk already, I... Um, I'm working with a client, uh, and and on a regular basis, we <clears throat> send out a leader publication that uh, adapts, uh, takes content that we have potentially published or not, and targets it for leaders. And and so it's an interesting exercise. I was just doing it yesterday, going through and looking at um, information about joining a mentorship program, let's just say, in a workplace um, and reframing that where it relates to, in this case, leaders. We're all, we all are looking for the what's in it for me factor and where we can, again, be creative in, in imagining what those variety of factors might be. Um, in this case, leaders generally want to do a good job leading. They want to get ahead as leaders, um, et cetera. And so reframing it as this is an opportunity for you to build your leadership skills um, is, uh, is, a way, is a way to engage that specific audience with, again, thinking about it with them in mind. But we've also hit upon a, a thing that I think we do well, but maybe we need to also find a way to break the little habit. And, um, you know, when you were in, School, you were taught not to plagiarize. Before that, they just called it copying from your neighbor and looking at their paper and doing things. And then we get in the corporate world, you're sort of taught to not reinvent the wheel and you're supposed to um, you know, leverage best practices. And one of the things that everybody was taught to do is go do benchmarking and see what everybody else is doing. And I think sometimes that seeing what everybody else is doing and then copying it because it's sort of a safe place to go is the road to mediocrity. Um, it sort of gets you into that white noise category we we're talking about. And I think so what we need to do is still continue to look at what everybody else is doing and then figure a way to do something different that's going to stand out from all the other stuff. And I know that all of us have spent time doing judging and evaluations on entries and awards programs, including IABC's Gold Quill. And I do think that the thing that sets the award winners from the others is that element of creativity above and beyond the you know, I've nailed all the basics, I've nailed all the fundamentals, and it comes in with some creativity. Yeah, one of the uh, watchwords we have over here where I work is, is consistent execution, which seems to argue against creativity, but I just try to be consistently creative. Uh, yeah, it's never the same thing twice, right? Uh, I don't remember which of you mentioned, uh, I think it was Brad, you mentioned long articles. Um, and... You know, being creative doesn't necessarily mean, you know, incorporating a lot of flourish and fluff and, you know, building out an article. Uh, as, as John Devaney likes to point out, uh, Blair Pascal in a letter to his son said, I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I'm sending you a long one. Um, is, there, is it possible to be creative with a lot of the, you know, minutia that we need to communicate organizationally? Uh, how, how, do you, how do you apply that filter when you have to 
crank out something that's going to be short enough that people actually have the time to read it. And you know, also, I think it's worth noting that most people are reading corporate communications on a screen these days, and they're less inclined to spend a lot of time with that than they used to be inclined to spend with something that was in a printed publication. I'll jump in and just sort of say, I think for years we have been doing, but not necessarily making a rigorous practice of doing what it is that people do when they read, which is sort of the, you know, if the headline grabs you, maybe you read the lead. Maybe if you get through the lead, you'll get into the body of whatever. So we've sort of talked in the past about onion skins and peeling back. And I think if you follow an inverted pyramid style, if you come up with a clever headline, you are following that, which is what readers do. And I just think we've spent too much time putting it down there, all that detail. And I think we need to find new ways to package things so that whether it's a link to an addendum, whether it's a short list, some whether it's a graph, we need to find creative ways to be able to package some of the stuff so that it isn't all one long piece of prose that starts at the very, very top and requires you to read all the way to the bottom because that's not the way readers behave, whether it's on a screen or, you know, even if you do have a, the luxury of a publication, something in print. So we need to do the, what it is that the readers are doing with our content. Oh, Brad, that's a great point because I think back about the journey that people take when they're collecting information. You grab them with a headline and something short, think of an advertisement, but then you get them to go to the next level for more information. And people who are interested in the topic will go and read long in depth articles but you have to get them there first. You have to take them on that journey. So your idea of packaging is a good one. Also, you know, repurposing, I think, is worth talking about when, Brad, you, you're talking about providing you know, different approaches to getting the message out so it appeals to different people. Uh, but if you start with an article, then you can say, okay, can I get a couple of infographics? out of this? Uh, are there some social media pull quotes that I can get out of this? Um, how important is repurposing to this concept of creativity? Absolutely. I, I'm glad you mentioned social media because I, you know, that to me, that's, that's, um, I was, I was thinking that's a bit of a, I'm not going to say elephant in the room, but um, it's our competition, right? We, we are all on our screens and being distracted by clickbait that we may or may not fall for and so as communication professionals you know we can't forget that that's the context to your point shell most people are looking at it on a screen often a small screen that's the context in which we are context in which we're operating and the and the and the um you know the distractions that our readers have so just to go back a moment to kind of the basic nuts and bolts communication i mean you've got a a quarter, as you say, a quarterly report or a staff announcement or something like that, probably there isn't a lot of room for an additional layer of creativity other than to ensure you're bringing a human voice and some good storytelling in the case of a staff announcement. Um, and I, and I, and I'm going to, I keep kind of going back, but um, I did want to say off the top that from a foundational perspective, a lot of what we're talking about, in my opinion, is something that has perhaps a skill that's gotten a little rusty in in many of us communication professionals and that is really really strong writing <laughs> um, we talk about us as strategists we talk about us uh, and the importance of our role in in um, helping our businesses and our organizations um, advance their objectives and I am fully passionate about that element of the work we do. However, what I've noticed over the years is that that basic skill of good, strong writing um, is sometimes not as strong as we'd like to see. So that's where we need to call on ourselves to stay fresh, to take the writing refresh courses. None of us is above that. Uh, and um, and to and so that we can continue to bring fresh language and fresh approaches that is current and competitive. I don't think that even began to answer the question you originally asked, Shell. But I don't even remember what it was at this point. <laughs> well, I, but I'll, I I'll go to conference one... and 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 you know I'll go listen to Ann Wiley or or Jeff Harrington, whom I've heard you know a million times. But it, it's important to be reminded and inspired again to crank out this copy. Well, I guess one of the ways that we could really look at things is how can we parse things into bundles. I mean, one one of our skill sets historically has been let's write 
the one piece and sort of one and done, check it off of our to-do list. Instead of saying, okay, I need to do a story about this. What if we say, I need to do multiple stories. Each one's a little short. They sort of build on each other. It becomes a serial. And I'm going to park each one of these three or four days apart. And so people are going to see a steady stream of things, knowing full well that many people will never see the one article that we posted. But maybe if we do sort of take that thing and chop it up into a logical series, people might pay a little bit more attention to it. Yeah, to that point, um, we have a comment from Brian Kilgore saying to make people read lots, lay it out in many bit-sized chunks. Yeah. I, I think that I would build on what uh, Jennifer said. One of my favorite reads just about every day these days is a thing called Next Draft. I love um, Next Draft. By Dave Pell, <laughs> yeah. who considers himself the managing editor of the internet. And all he really does is sort of... Um, pulls together what he considers the leading stories, some humorous, some serious for the day. And his major job is writing a, um, I'll say a clever headline that gets you to read, what is this all about? And I remember one when a couple of legislators were kicked out of the uh, assembly in the state of Tennessee. The headline was, Tennessee, you later agitator. <laughs> we just started, oh my God, I wish I'd come up with that sort of thing. He also had one about a uh, Russian plane bombing a Russian city by mistake, and he called it put in harm's way. It's like, oh, my God. Uh, I'm going to read that. Yeah, and it speaks to the importance of headlines. And I remember when SEO was really on the rise, uh, one of the complaints was that it was killing good headline writing, uh, particularly for external communications, because now we were writing headlines that would be packed with keywords and uh, attract the search engine crawlers and make sure that we came up higher in the search engine results than one that's going to grab the attention of the reader and, and pull them into the story. And uh, one of the articles I read lamented that we'll, we'll never see uh, the return of the great pun-focused headlines uh, or... Yeah, they, they listed some of the famous headlines over the years, headless body found in topless bar, uh, things like that. So. But we can have fun with this sort of fun stuff, too, because I ended up writing for one of my clients um, a headline for they are teaching classes in problem solving. And it's like the come up with a clever headline for a class that's being and it's just like evolving your solving. And um, the, the stats the next day, because this is one of many articles that appeared on the uh, Daily Digest, and it was one of the highest rated, it was the highest rated story that appeared. And I don't think it was because people wanted to necessarily sign up for the class, but they wanted, they got captured by the headline and read through. So yeah, a plus. Well, let's talk about storytelling. Uh, Jennifer, I, we, we got to do storytelling, right? Uh, and I think there's a lot of communication that goes on, particularly in, in the internal comms world, where we just tell people something rather than find a way to engage them in a story. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this, uh, Steve Crescenzo shared with me many years ago, it was in a printed publication. Uh, they were trying to build awareness of the company's employee assistance program and how it can benefit you if you're having problems in your life. And, uh, you know, how we usually do that is Acme Incorporated has an employee assistance program that offers the following services, right? And we just want to make sure that people know about it. This publication, uh, they told the story of, a, of an employee, if I remember correctly, he worked in IT, um, who had, uh, his marriage had ended uh, and it led him to uh, smoke more and eat more and drink more. And he was really on a path to really poor health uh, and called the employee assistance program. Uh, and they said, you need to find something that uh, will encourage you to exercise. Uh, so have you considered something like ballroom dancing? And so he went out and, and uh, learned ballroom dancing, ended up being competitive, um, entering all kinds of competitions, uh, lost 100 pounds, stopped drinking, stopped smoking, and got his life together. Uh, and this was in probably five or six paragraphs that they conveyed this story. That's a whole lot more compelling than we have an EAP. You should take advantage of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean... By definition, 
the, the again storytelling is a bit of a it's a bit of a new black right now um and and so i think it the term gets perhaps i'm not even i'm not ever going to complain that it gets overused because i'm thrilled that it's here um but uh, you know, by definition, we're looking for ways to engage our audience and to engage our readers, usually involving um, elements beyond facts and figures and straight information about what number to call <laughs> for for that um, that EA, EAP program. Um, and uh, and so when we can engage people using senses, using um, uh, other elements that connect to that that make make the content relatable, um, we are more likely to, in, we're more likely to see the action or reaction that we're looking for, again, from a communication, from a strategic communications perspective, right? So if we go into every piece of communication asking, what's the action or reaction I'm looking for? What's the audience channel message? We're more, we're more likely to see um, an uptake on that when we are, um, engaging people creatively. So we've talked about headlines. We've talked, we touched on visuals. Um, I wouldn't mind coming back to that, but also, um, but also just um, finding relatable and uh, different content um, and looking at our competition. We read the accounts we do, you know, the, the one you mentioned, Brad, we, we sign up for those newsletters. We read the social media we do mostly and this is true even with my third year business students when i ask them you know who are your who who what follow what accounts do you look at uh, first thing in the day and we do a little bit of analysis um often it's to do with good writing and to go to do with good strong content like when they actually kind of ana analyze a little well the other thing about a story is people are more likely to share that I mean, we always have employees who don't read the articles on the internet, right? And they're the ones who say, oh, nobody told me. Uh, but if you tell a story rather than just lay out the facts, uh, then people are likely to say, hey, did you see that article about Mike and IT and the EAP? That was really interesting. Uh, as opposed to, you know, nobody's going to say, did you see that story about the fact that we have an EAP? <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and I mean, case in point, Shell, your your anecdote from from Steve Crescenzo all these years later, you remember that story, right? Yep. You're not likely to remember an example of a of a of a program that helped someone who'd gone through a, a marriage breakup <laughs> um, <laughs> or, or someone who was struggling in some way, but you are likely to remember a story. And and when we can make it more personal, which is again takes us out of the realm of business communication, because for a long, long time we were many of us uh, <laughs> of a certain age were taught to strip a lot of the personality and the personal content from our um, from our communication. And you know, I remember early in my career going through that stage because I had I had done a lot of creative writing as a young person and having to strip that out. And then we then getting to that welcome stage um, in the evolution of our work where we were adding that back in. And so, you know, we talked to our leaders about showing up in more vulnerable ways, showing the human side. Uh, for a client last year, we launched a whole set of new values, which, you know, values can be dry. Um, I'd like to think they weren't, but they're just values to most people, right? They're just a bunch of words on page. And we embarked on this value storytelling exercise where we lined up probably six or eight individuals. No, there were eight. There were one, two for each value and invited them. And I worked with them to kind of express the way that value showed up in their work. And the stories that came out ranging from like really vulnerable stuff about from, from new immigrants, um, new immigrant families who had gone through some struggles to, uh, to very personal, um, uh, yeah, just very personal stories and insights um, really brought those values to life in a way that no other uh, corporate voiced storytelling uh, could do. Well, one of the other things that I think that we can do to involve our readers a little bit more, you sort of talked about how we had stripped out a lot of that personal stuff and we almost become these um, reporters that did third person, impersonal um, this kind of stuff is use a lot more second person, get some you going in things to try to sort of make the reader relate to that it, what it is that you're talking about as opposed to making it purely objective. So 
Um, there are some writing techniques that we can employ that um, help us with that. And if we can, I think the hardest part probably for almost all of us is finding those really great stories about an individual who has benefited from or who is the perfect example of someone who was able to do this in a safety program or was able to um, save gazillions of dollars for the company or was an outstanding salespeople and find those people um, somewhere in the organization and, and shine a spotlight on them. I think most organizations are a little bit more willing to let you do that. Um, but there was a long time when it was just like, you know, don't make it, don't make it focus on that person because there's many people doing that. And that's sort of not the, that's the opposite of storytelling. Oh, the other one I always loved was uh, we don't want to focus on individuals because that becomes part of the permanent record. And what if they leave? Then we have an ex-employee. <laughs> Uh, but to that point, we do have a, a question here. Uh, this is from Mirko, uh, IABC member. Uh, met him in person at the uh, World Conference this year, which was great. But uh, he asks, uh, when your work goes through multiple levels of approval, in effect, different audiences with whom different messages resonate, what are your strategies for persuading them that your approach is the one? Um, I have a response to that. You know, I used to work in... Uh, manufacturing organization, almost all engineers. And I'd have to get approval from a lot of engineers. So my approval process was very specific. It said, you, you, know, you are the engineer in charge of this. Your realm in saying how this is appropriate relates to these specific tops. Accuracy to the product, is everything technically correct? Um, but these other elements, you can provide comments on, that doesn't mean they're gonna be incorporated. So I um, provided that to the, all the different levels of approval so that they could focus on what was important for their perspective in the message, not killing the creative. Well, and isn't our job really, whether it's that approval part of things or writing this thing in the first place, is to connect the dots. We're the ones who are supposed to go out and do some of the homework and see how all these pieces are related and pull it into a cohesive whole. And it doesn't hurt to hear the opinions of others, as you're pointing mm -hmm. out, Cindy. But I think the other piece is that um, we probably have done some of that homework and logistics and we're listening to what it is that people have say. And if they come up with, oh, I hadn't thought about that, that's one thing. But if it's sort of like the, yeah, I've heard about that and I've tried it and it doesn't work, I think that's where people have to defer to your expertise. And part of it is that how do you sell yourself and your experience to the others so that you are given a little bit more uh, freedom to be able to make some of those editorial choices of the what works and what doesn't. I think the other piece is that we need to have this command of numbers and be able to prove to people that we know what we're doing because we tried it with this, 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 and here are the results that we got, which is much better than when we tried that, 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 that. And um, we don't often focus on that selling our ideas and our concepts and ourselves hard enough in organizations. I was going to say, I think, um, Mirko, your your challenge is, is twofold or your opportunity is twofold. One is probably a little longer term, which is training those around you about exactly what Cindy described, which is your role in the process versus their role in the process. And then the other is, you know, again, knowing our audience as communication professionals in terms of um, who we're engaging. So there are executives who whom I know just like all of us, my, I parked my ego where with regards to writing a long time ago. So if someone wants to change something I've written and has a good reason for it, um, I'll go to bat for it, but I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. However, um, often there's a way of engaging that specific audience of the person who's going to give the approval in a way that makes them feel they've put their mark on it. So that's sometimes it, right? That ha Letting them feel like uh, they, um, their voice is part of that particular piece. Uh, again, it, perhaps we've we've written it on their behalf, and uh, the tone isn't quite right. So I do try and engage uh, those who who need to approve um, in different ways to ensure they feel like uh, they've got some ownership of it. One other little trick that I've employed is sometimes if you can take that thing and get approval from the very highest person in the organization um, and sort of go, you know, the CEO didn't have any problems with this article. So what exactly is it that you don't like about it? And um, that sort of quiets down some of the naysayers around the uh, world. So, 
Yeah, a couple other thoughts. Uh, when I uh, my first job in communications was at Arco, uh, the department led by Dave Orman, who is a fellow. Uh, and the approvals there, uh, everybody knew what that meant. It, it wasn't a, the approval of the approach. It was, you're just checking the accuracy of the information. That's your job. How we're presenting it, that's not up to you. Uh, and everybody knew that. Uh, that was the policy. Uh, so that made life easier. So having an approval policy that, you know, your job is to check for accuracy, um, not to tell us that this shouldn't be an article, it should be a video. That's, you know... I'm not going to tell you that this uh, legal case should be tried or, or settled. <laughs> you know, I'm not a lawyer, right? Uh, so having that policy can help. Uh, the other thing is, and, and the first time I saw this uh, was when I was doing some consulting work with Sears many years ago in the early days of their internet. And they were uh, talking about the homepage for internal comms presence on the internet. And what should it be rather than here we are? And I asked, well, what are your biggest pain points? And they said, people coming to us with a preconception of, of how to communicate something. And they've already got it in their head that this should be a brochure or this should be a video. Um, and I said, well, why don't you uh, have the homepage be an intake form? Uh, what is the outcome you're looking for? Who's your audience? What's your deadline? Do you have a budget? Um, and uh, that sets the expectation that we're going to come up with the approach to communicate that um, and sort of takes that factor out of the, the mix. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're doing that here now. Um, actually, we, we use ServiceNow and we're having them set up a ticket system for internal comms, uh, partly to document how many requests we get and why we're overloaded, but partly to uh, have them tell us, you know, what is the outcome that you're looking for? Who is this intended to reach and, and the like um, and get them out of this? We need an article on the Internet or we need uh, something up on the digital signage. Uh, let us figure out the best way to do that. That's our job. Uh, Jennifer, I knew you wanted to talk about visuals. Uh, so so let's let's talk about visuals. Uh, you know, the the Web in uh, general has made us more visually focused. Um, we know how quickly people are going to click away from a page. Um, so there's ways to convey information visually. Uh, how do you how do you sync that up with storytelling, Jennifer? Well, I just am a, a passionate evangelist for visual storytelling. And I um, when I posted about this session, I talked about how the best uh, graphic designers and creative people I've worked with are the ones who've asked me at the beginning of a project, you know, how do you want this communications, this piece of communications, this writing, this whatever the case may be, how do you want it to make people feel? Um, and and then to trust that the, that creative person knows everything from what font best to use to, to not to mention the letting and the kerning and all of those things that I get kind of geeky about because I've seen them make a difference, um, but also to work collaboratively to come up with some um, with some visual elements. Quick little uh, example of this. Uh, I worked a number of years ago on the first of a few corporate history books that I've uh, been lucky enough to be involved in. And this was for a forest products company. And um, early on in that company's history, uh, three founding brothers had had a huge impact on the organization. And tragically, again, very early on, one of them, the youngest of the three, who was the most beloved, died in a, in a, in a helicopter crash at a site that the company was exploring for some for some logging. And um, 40 years later, we were doing a, a, a history book and uh, we were given full carte blanche access to almost anyone, including members of the family who had been so instrumental in, in forming the culture of this company from early on. Um, and we ended up speaking to uh, a descendant of the of the of the brother who had died in the crash, and another family member of the pilot uh, who had also died, and um, and we talked about it was a it's, it was a very very um, formative story for the company, um, one that we couldn't ignore and that we needed to tell. Uh, we talked about a lot of ways of presenting that respectfully. Um, it was a real tragedy and obviously people lost people they loved. And uh, we, in fact, were given access to the site 
um, where the crash had occurred. Um, after, and we did some photography, we spent weeks, if not months, it, through that process deciding how to present that. And in the end, we um, we did a very, very short um, uh, eulogy, if you if you will, for the people who who perished in that crash. And then the photo accompanying it was simply a photo of forest. There was nothing graphic. There was nothing um, even specific. And um, and it was it. I have to say it was one of the most powerful pairings of visual and written storytelling I've done on a subject that was very sensitive. Full circle, and I'm, I won't give credit to just that specific um, set of pages, but one of the most amazing things that came out of that project was the surveying that we did afterward of employees. We had set measurable objectives in advance, uh, but one of the areas we had not addressed was around, uh, or that we had not set objectives around was related to safety. And overwhelmingly, we had employees coming back and saying, I, I will work more safely at, at my job because of this book, because of these set of stories. I will never want to have happened what happened to Sam, which was a series of, of, um, of errors. Uh, and, um, and so I will pay more attention because of these, because of these stories. So there's an impact of storytelling and strong, creative visual communication having an impact on the bottom line, because when workers work more safely, organizations do better. And, you know, visuals are really important. I'm teaching visual communication class right now. So, uh, highly relevant, but the, you know, it has to relate to what you're doing. And it has to relate to the audience. You can't just throw a bunch of visuals and fonts and things into a communication because you're just creating noise. But think about how you could use uh, simple images or visuals to move your communication out of the meh and a little bit towards magnificent. Uh, if you are communicating a process, perhaps you use some word art that's focused around a process and put your process into it. it makes it much more interesting and compelling for the people that are reading it. And also, uh, it helps to grab the attention. You know, good graphic design leads the viewer through the piece. So it's like important to get that graphic design right, not just throw a bunch of stuff in. And in fact, any good creative ideas has to be relevant to the audience and the message and the context of the situation. So it's, it takes a bit more thinking about it, but it, it's kind of easy to do to add interesting visual elements. And you can even add visual elements to copy because you could use bold, you could use other fonts just to call attention to different things. We know people tend to scan today. They don't tend to read much. So having the, the copy that you want to be seen pulled out in an interesting way is also a good technique. I think we have to go also a step further and realize that we are um, working in a world where Insta and Reels <laughs> and video is just as powerful, maybe even more so than some of the things we've done. If you haven't taken classes or studied, you know, filmmaking or videography, mm -hmm. um, the storytelling aspect on mm -hmm. the screen, whether it's a small screen or a large screen, is comparable in many ways to what it is that we would do in print or sort of a static thing on a computer. But um, I think we need to sort of learn that skill set. And just as much as we've been talking about what is it that you read, what sites do you go to, it's like the what are you watching? Um, you know, what are the shows that you're binging on? How do people grab attention, um, whether it's a movie or some sort of a television program, um, whether it's the stuff that you're watching on Instagram or TikTok or what have you, and find ways to incorporate those tools into our communications programs and begin to think visually as much as we think sort of logically about the audience the desired outcome, the feeling, and all those sorts of fun things. We need to become masters of that as an integral part of our communications programs. Yeah, I would add that uh, our employees, we know uh, many, and, and my company, it's a little over half, uh, follow the company on social media channels. Mm -hmm. So being creative out there is not just reaching your external stakeholders, you're probably going to be reaching employees as well. Uh, I was going to mention that one of the, uh, the the most memorable annual reports I've ever seen, um, and I've seen a lot. I've I've worked on many. 
but this was, I, I think it was Warehouse, right? I know it was a paper company. Um, and if you've ever worked on an annual report, you know, the front of the book uh, is whatever you want it to be. Uh, but a lot of organizations see it as your best marketing piece of the year. Uh, a lot of effort goes into it. It's got to convey some important information, but it, it's the back of the book that is you know, the accounting uh, required data. Uh, so this book, um, actually what it, it, you opened it up and it, and it said, uh, last year was better than the year before. We're hoping that this year will be better than last year. Uh, we hope you enjoy the pictures and the numbers. And then you turn the page and it's just stunning photography of the, the, their forests uh, and of their mills. Um, and when you're done looking at the pictures, you got to the audited results. Uh, there was no text. It was all just this stunning mm -hmm. photography. And I have to imagine people put those annual reports on their coffee tables <laughs> because it, it, this kind of book it was. I would have never thought of just doing photography at the front of an annual report. And, you know, photography, um, I'll go to bat for our um, partners in visual communication here, um, both again from a graphic design and a, and a, and a, and a photographic um, um, point of view. Um, it takes a bit of work, right? And often we may be strapped for budgets. Uh, maybe we've hired a freelance writer to help us out with an article. Um, and the idea of also hiring a photographer, uh, it just isn't isn't going to work these days. Um, not to diminish the skills of our of our colleagues, but these days we do have options around, uh, you know, smartphones give us give us some pretty amazing uh, tools to capture images. But um, Again, another example, I spoke about uh, a client for whom I, I did a, a values story that connected in a new immigrant family. And in this particular case, it was a financial institution that had given her parents a mortgage when other organizations wouldn't. And so I had a photo of her and, and she and her, um, her family now live in the same house that her parents um, arrived to Canada and, and purchased. Um, so I had a photo of her, which was great. People, employees love to see other employees and again, have a little bit of insight. And especially in these days of remote work where we don't always, um, we don't see, we don't see different elements of each other in the same ways that we do, uh, that we used to. Um, but I asked her to go digging and try and find an older photo of her family at that house. And the one she found was just absolutely precious. Uh, and it took a while. And I, you know, I pushed a little and said it really would add to the story. And it was the story. Those photos side by side told everything that I could have written. We, we have a comment from our fellow fellow Alice Brink who says that the annual report comment reminds me that creativity goes beyond words and pictures. We can use sound, sense, and physical ambience uh, to help support our messages. Well, certainly some of the best um, IABC gold quill entries, and we've spent in order, I mean, if you, if you took the cumulative time that the four of us have spent looking over people's work. I think one of the lessons I would say is that if you don't have that opportunity now, find a way to get yourself into an evaluation session because you will become one inspired. Second, you'll also be a little bit more uh, aware of the processes that go into it. And I think the part would be also that you'll see how creativity is um, an integral part along with sort of the uh, fundamentals, the deliverables, the metrics and all the other things that you have to you know, knock out of the park to be able to be an award winner. But the thing that sets it apart is that creative spark that just um, blows people away. And all of us, um, you know, w when, we, when we're evaluating as a group, we'll always come together around lunchtime or at the end of the day and just say, oh, you need to see this. This one just blew me out of the water. And then you take some of that and take it with you as you go back to your job and start thinking, you know, how can I integrate some of what it is that I've learned from others into my work. And in a sense, this is the reverse of what I was saying, which was be don't benchmark all the time, but benchmark selectively, find things, and then find a new way to apply something you may have seen over there in a space that has never seen something like that. And I think that's what we're hearing from Alice too, is like there are lots of different elements that you could use in an annual report. You don't have to focus on the ones that everybody else is using. 
Well, or again, not all of our work is so-called ink on paper and not, and I don't by that mean yeah. um, actual paper, but words on screen. Um, you know, many of us are called on to um, speech write for executives or be involved in uh, town hall or public events and the ways in which we can engage um, um, the ways in which we can engage our audiences in sensory elements of those uh, of those um, those delivery channels uh, is important. Um, uh, you know, I don't I didn't mean to I didn't come in here meaning to bring up forestry so often, but um, <laughs> I do remember a, a ribbon cutting at a mill where and this just seems obvious where um where they made sure to turn the sawdust in the morning so you had that lovely waft of of uh of of um fresh cut wood um at a media event which you know it's a pretty common it's a pretty common scent for all of them but um you know almost to a t every single reporter who attended that event commented on the against the backdrop of the lovely scent of pine chips <laughs> <laughs> That you can even instill that uh, sense of the smell in it from an image. I mean, Jennifer, you brought up the image of the big forest and nothing else. You can think about what the audience is seeing and feeling and smelling when they look at an image like that. It'll take them back to something that gives them that sense of smell or other sensory items. One of the challenges that I think we face uh, is that we come into our work looking to be creative. I think you know, we, we start out as writers, most of us, uh, into an environment where the leaders of the organization are all business. Um, I mean, I've literally had executives who say, we're not here to have fun. Uh, how do you overcome that with uh, the leadership of an organization that thinks everything has to be very, very businesslike. I think executives that are still saying that are probably not successful executives these days. <laughs> I just have to say. <laughs> yeah, but I think you're right, though, Shell. We are sort of drummed into this world of conformity. Um, everybody has to follow certain things. We have processes we need to follow. And I think our goal is to be able to prove that Sometimes that breaking the rule is actually the right thing to do because it helps you accomplish the goals that you have in mind. And I, I look at different things. I mean, at one point uh, before launching a video program, one of the things I did was do a pilot of the video. I, I was lucky enough to have some budget and some wherewithal to be able to do a pilot. And we had a test group that didn't see the video and answered some questions. We had the pilot group that saw the video and answered the same questions. We could show a marked difference in sort of views of the world and thoughts that were running through their heads and their belief in certain statements. And I think what we need to do is apply a little bit of the left brain thinking that many of these managers are coming at us with, which the you need to do this, 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 it needs to measure that and come at it with the element of surprise and creativity and difference that uh, we know is going to be able to um, at least attract more readers and move a little bit more people down that um, line of the, ooh, I'm buying into this. I, I like the place where I'm working. I would love to recommend this place to work. I think we have some um, loftier goals in some ways than merely conforming. So where does creativity come from for you? Uh, I'll tell you, a lot of the ideas that I get come from, uh, you know, not, not to be a, a, a marketer uh, pushing a, a brand here, but it comes from IABC. Uh, I remember being at the conference where Soledad O'Brien spoke, and she talked about the power of video, uh, and she said, rather than sending out another email, uh, why not a video? So I got back to the office just as uh, our CEO was going to introduce his new mandate around managing and uh, wanted to send out an email. And I said, I've got an idea. I just did exactly what Soledad O'Brien suggested. I said, let's get you into the main meeting room. Let's invite everybody who's around in. We'll shoot video of it. And you can announce it and have immediate feedback from the people in the room. 
uh, and then we'll share the video with the rest of the company. And I swear that message got out faster and got embedded more thoroughly than if he had sent out yet another email, no matter how well it had been written. And no approval process on it either, because who's going <laughs> to challenge what it is that he said in the public? That's exactly right. That, that was a no brainer. <laughs> so I would like to say that the most innovative and effective communication themes and creative ideas that I've come up with have come from my knowledge of the industry, the product, the service, the audience, and then some other thing like a trend, some research, a season, something like that. And then when you smash these all together or find parallels, a great idea comes out. And um, an example of this would be years ago, uh, I always knew this research that the most uh, engaging image in advertising would be children or babies. But I worked at a company of engineers. Our audience of customers were engineers and it just didn't seem relevant. So I, I just kind of put it on the side. But then years later, we uh, changed our tagline to protect and transport. We made products that were used to move chemicals and materials through the manufacturing to become computer chips. And once we did that, we worked with our agency to come up with a fabulous, great idea. And it was to have the image of a young toddler created using the symbols from our engineering drawings. And then uh, the copy was said, it's your brainchild. It's all yours. You came up with it. But we're here to protect it and make sure it thrives. And that series of ads was so successful. I love that, Cindy. I lo that's a that's a great example. And you know, I was <clears throat> I wanted to to um, sort of back us up again from the output to the actual to the creativity in ideation, right? And so, to your point, it it is kind of this mashup of something my my kids said to me this morning, and um, you know, Oppenheimer that I saw two nights ago, and something I read, and then and then the voices that that are in my head um, that come in from 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 fellow professionals, from uh, colleagues, uh, etc. Um, but you know, we need to make sure that we're creating the space for that idea generation early on in our in our processes and uh, surrounding our teams, such that that they and we are empowered to have that kind of more creative output. I think some of it also is the, what are you exposing yourself to? And we talked a little about what it is that you read on a regular basis. And I know when I had a role um, on the international side of things in a corporate communications department, everybody else was reading Fortune, Forbes, Business Week, New York Times. Um, my goal was to, yeah, scan that sort of stuff, but see what was the Nikkei reporting? What was the South China Morning Post reporting? What was Le Monde reporting on? and um, seeing the world a little bit differently. And the other one I like um, sharing with people to sort of get them thinking a little bit more about the, am I seeing the world exactly the same way everybody else is? Or is there an element of surprise, an element of creativity that can I add? Is I love watching stand-up comedy and people like Stephen Wright, George Carlin, Jonathan Winters, Robin Williams, all had, they lived in the same world we did by and large, but they also saw the world differently than we did. And can we bring that same sort of the, you see this, but are you seeing this to our work? And um, I guess I would say go off and watch some comedy and, and and enjoy it and find ways to work that into that capture your audience and inspire them to do whatever it is that they need to do more efficiently, better, and take the organization to the next level. I think it's also worth thinking about uh, having um, experiences in the organization that you connect to potential communications that you weren't considering before. I remember when I was at Mattel, I was in with one of our brand uh, people in the legal department, and she mentioned that we have boxes of letters that kids have sent to the company. And I went, really? Uh, she, she gave them to me and we went through them and we ended up publishing a bunch of them in an issue of the, uh, the magazine that we sent to employees. This was back in the mid 80s. There were not computers being used in communication yet. Uh, but we actually had the actual letter in. You know, we didn't 
trans, you know, rewrite it and, and set it in type. We actually used the photos of the, the actual in, letter on the notepad paper or what have you. It was the most popular thing we ever published, you know. So uh, we are out of time. Uh, and I do want to share that Brian Kilgore says that this is your best show. <laughs> so uh, good job, panel. <laughs> I really appreciate your taking the time. You really uh, have to, the best audience. That's right. We had the best audience. That's right. Uh, and, and, a, and a fairly sizable one for uh, the live uh, stream of the panel. I do want to mention the next episode of Circle of Fellows. Uh, episode number 96 will be on Thursday, September 21st at uh, noon Eastern time. Um, I'll be on a cruise ship on the uh, European Riviera. So uh, Brad has graciously agreed to uh, moderate that panel. Uh, the topic is leadership in communications, and the panelists uh, are Diane Gajewski, uh, Jane Mitchell, and Mark Schumann. Good group to talk about leadership. Uh, so uh, hope to see everybody next month. Uh, thanks for watching. <laughs>